Good afternoon. So I was flying down here late last night and realized a couple of things. One, I am your last speaker. And two, I counted it, and you can count it too. You've had 110 speakers. That is awesome. So congratulations to you all for actually being able to squeeze that all in. But that puts a little pressure on me uh, to try to do something a little different. And after listening to Corey Conrad, who said literally exactly what I was going to say. So thank you, Corey, for stealing my notes. And I can't inspire you any more than what Natalie Self just told you. Um, so I wanted to do something a little bit different. And I think you also, frankly, given all the familiar faces here, I think you know us uh, pretty well. You know some of the things that we do. Um, our platforms on diversity and, and pay, uh, sorry, pay equity for race and gender in the United States that we've taken to Canada um, and to China. You know that we're hiring refugees and opportunity youth and veterans. Uh, you know we have 99% sustainability. The partnerships in this room are what allow that scale to happen. And you heard us talk about scale for good. That is the opportunity for Starbucks that is only possible with your partnerships and your expertise. Uh, best example lately is the partnership that we have with Points of Light and Natalie Paquin, who has allowed us to do a pioneering uh, community service program or service fellows programs where you have a barista working 20 hours a week in a store in 100 different cities. But thanks to Points of Light and a lot of you all out there in your local partnerships, that barista is working 20 hours a week with an NGO doing community service for six or seven months. That is a new model of how you do community service at scale with true impact. That's national service and employment at the same time. So um, I wanted to talk about all this. I love talking about what we do, honestly. Um, and yes, if it sounds like doing social impact at Starbucks is the greatest job on the planet, it is. It's absolutely incredible because we get to do so much. But I want to show you something and premiere something for you today that we just did because this is the right audience to show it to first. And instead of asking and talking about all the good things we're doing and how we use our scale for good, I want to ask a question to think about. What happens when companies who are pursuing good, like yours, what happens when you fail? What happens when things go wrong and your mission and your values are tested? Our mission is to nurture the human spirit. One cup, one person, one store at a time. And when we failed Mr. Robinson and Mr. Nelson in Philadelphia a little bit more than a year ago, we failed globally. We failed everything that we're about. And all of the four decades <clears throat> of social impact that we've been doing were questioned. And they didn't matter because we failed them. We did not live our mission and values. So what do you do when that's not us and yet it was us? Our CEO, Kevin Johnson, decided to take the same approach, frankly, that we do with a lot of our social impact, which is to take a long, hard look in the mirror and be honest about what your role and responsibility is. And then decide to own it and own it all and then decide to do the right thing no matter what it is and no matter what the cost. And we're still in the process of doing this. We made comprehensive policy changes about what it means to be a Starbucks customer. And a lot of people don't like this. Our business has never been better. We shut our stores down on May 29th. Inconceivable for most retailers to be able to survive that economically. We didn't do it to solve racism. We did it to have a common experience to come back to our mission and values of what it meant to be a welcoming place, to have a common experience and education about the history of discrimination against African Americans in public places. We did that at scale, at enormous economic risk, but we knew we had to do something extraordinary for our own people to recover and to reestablish who we were. We have, we have continued on that with what we call pour-over sessions, monthly training, comprehensive training to all of our partners about what it means to be welcoming and to start dealing with unconscious bias and leaning into it. And through an innovative partnership with Arizona State University, they're the ones that we partner with on our college achievement plan. We're sending 25,000 baristas to get a four-year college degree with ASU over the last few years. They graduate debt-free with a college degree 
they, and there's no catch. They can leave Starbucks when they get their degree. We started talking to ASU and their experts on diversity and inclusion about what we could do, not for Starbucks, but how can we share, like we do with coffee, like we do with green building, like we do with our opportunity events. How can we share what we're learning, both the good, the bad, and the ugly? How can we share with the rest of the world, especially retailers, law enforcement, government? Can we learn and can we make this open source? And so ASU, with their experts and their academic experts, have created a curriculum called To Be Welcoming that launched just two days ago. And I want to share with you um, an introductory video by famous director Stanley Nelson about what the foundational course on unconscious bias and to be welcoming is. It's about four minutes long, but I wanted to share this with you. You'll remember this a lot more than me, so enjoy. My name is Stanley Nelson. I make documentary films about race, identity, perception, and the decades-long struggle for all people to be treated as equals in public spaces. I created this film to introduce a series of free courses Starbucks asked Arizona State University to develop about these topics for you. In it, you'll learn ways to better understand each other, deepen our connections, and really see each other. So when I walk into a room, I think the first people think is that I'm a man. And then after they look at me a little more, they might say, oh, lesbian. Um, and I wish, I guess, that people could just see human. They don't know what to make of me or where I'm from, so they oftentimes will say, go back to where you came from. Um, well, I'm indigenous. This is where my people are from. I would describe myself as, as a Sikh. Um, and I describe myself as an American. I was born and raised here in the U.S. Um, in San Antonio, Texas. You know, the way that I would describe myself as like a sports-loving, um, joking, humor-loving kind of person uh, is probably different than how most people would describe me when they see me on the street. Ethnically, um, I'm white, but I'm also Ashkenazi Jewish. I feel that every step I take towards being Jewish is an act of defiance against that anti-Semitism. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard jokes about like money or even Holocaust jokes in elementary school and middle school and high school. It, it's so ingrained like as a joke into American society. It crosses the line sometimes from humor into, you know, that's just not okay. I identify myself as a uh, black trans woman, uh, even more a fat black trans woman. Um, I think that has a lot of kind of layers to that. <laughs> and I say I'm Middle Eastern and they're just shocked. They're like, but you don't look like them. And I'm like, what do you mean like them? The first thing that people notice about me is my chair when they see me for the first time. I feel like I have to prove that I am an individual who does a lot. You know, if they, if they see my wheelchair, they automatically make assumptions that I can't do a lot of things. When I leave my house, regardless of where I'm going, the, I'm just leaving my house. Just walking out the door. I don't, I'm not walking out the door thinking, what kind of hurdle am I going to run into today? What kind of way am I going to be judged? I walk out a free man. I just do my thing. Where people look at a veteran as though that they're, 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 just, they're crazy because they had a reaction to an experience that they had. There's side effects that come when you, when you deal with war or side effects that come from, from experiencing trauma. When I say I'm a Trump supporter, people will automatically think that I'm a racist. I have been called stupid. I have been called um, uh, a woman hater. They're judging me by my political affiliation, by, by the color of my political party. You don't even know me. You're judging me by the president. I have experienced people coming to me and ask me, oh, where is your accent from? I have people that have told me, let me see your green car, <laughs> see if you can be working legally. I'm biologically and biracial, and I was adopted when I was very young and, and uh, raised by a black family. I think the way that uh, kind of race and ethnicity and culture play out in, in public spaces and in private ones has a lot to do with people's perceptions um, about uh, 
you know, what they see in front of them and the, the kinds of the ways that their social experiences growing up have informed their perceptions of the world and what they think about a particular group of people or think they know about a particular group of people. Most black parents prepare their kids for it. It's like, you know, you don't go into places unless you got money. You know what you want to get. You know, you don't window shop. And these are kind of lessons that, you know, is instilled in you early on being watched, um, feeling like you have to qualify your purpose for being in any given public space. I mean, you just have to continually always navigate and think and plan out like every, literally every single move you make. One thing that um, is constant around like all the public spaces I go to specifically, like cafes or restaurants where you have to leave your name. I use what we call in my Arab community, a restaurant name. <laughs> Usama goes by Sam, Muhammad goes by Mo. You just don't want to deal with all of the, the baggage and everything that comes with having to say your name. So you just give another name and it's an easy out, but it's, it's you die a little bit inside, I think every time you do that. To be part of this conversation, you are invited to participate in the ASU series to be welcoming. I, along with Starbucks, want to help us all move forward together. So you, you guys are the first ones to see that. We'd love your feedback. Mostly we'd love you, for you to share it and the curriculum. Uh, it's at To Be Welcoming on the Starbucks Learning Academy. It's all ASU content. They're the experts. Stanley Nelson directed the film, but we're sponsoring it. Um, if you believe that the world can and should be more welcoming for everybody, um, we'd love to work with you. You can text us. You can email us. Um, we're on this journey. We still have a lot of work to do, and we can't do it alone. But we think we're on to something, and we think leaning into unconscious bias is the way to do it. And if you believe that that is something that you want to work on, we'd love to work with you. If you believe in the, that a company can use its scale for good, we'd love to work with you. So thank you for enduring your 111th speaker, and congratulations on a great summit. Thanks. Thank